next speaker is uh, Judy Desai, um, and she's talking about scalar versus discrete space and error computation. I'll stop you here to see you. Thank you. Um, and thanks, uh, I wanted to thank Jochen, um, Tobias, and all of the other organizers for inviting us here today and having this workshop. Um, so this is a project that, I, that we started a few years ago, actually, with um, Adam Monahan, uh, Anna Christensen, Nils Beitzel, and then um, later on, Kota Endo joined us as a student. Um, and we had um, quite some nice time working together. Um, and so the idea here was to work on um, the subgrid scale variability of wind fields and try to build uh, the stochastic and statistical models to capture that, and in particular, um, capturing that in space and time. Um, as um, I'm sure many of you know, um, um, yeah, you probably know a way better than me that um, numerical model uh, typically do not capture like small scale phenomena that are happening at the scale finer than the resolution um, of the, the numerical model. Um, however, those scales tend to interact with um, larger scales and also the resolved scale by the model. And um, I mean, there's a need to uh, account for those um, and also quantify them um, to under represent better the system. Um, so in particular, in climate models, uh, fluxes are some of those uh, interaction. And um, here in particular, we're interested in air sea fluxes and more particularly in um, surf, uh, fluxes that are driven by surface wind speed. Um, and so here is kind of a generic um, expression of a surface flux. And um, the quantity that we are going to be interested in is the contribution of the surface wind speed to this flux. And so we're actually going to work um, on, this, um, uh, on this term only. And so here what we want to do is uh, definitely uh, try to understand and have a statistical model to represent the subgrid scale variability of the wind speed, and um, especially in this term. And so later on, we're going to work with a generic expression of this contribution of the wind speed. And the idea is that we're going to build a stochastic enhancer of that, um, of that term. Um, and so in weather and climate models um, are operating uh, with um, grid boxes. So here, these brackets are representing um, quantities that are available at the grid cell level. Um, and so in reality, when we are going to compute those fluxes, we are going to use whatever we have resolved of the wind, uh, meaning what we resolved of the zonal and meridional component of the wind, and then we calculate the flux on, with those quantities. But in an ideal life, one would like to compute the flux at a smaller scale if we were to have um, information about it, and then average this uh, small scale flux over the, at the level of the grid set. Um, and so mainly what we're gonna do here is um, like model the discrepancy between these two terms. Um, and there have been an uh, interest in the literature to um, try to bridge right, those, uh, the gap between those two quantities. Um, and so in an earlier work, um, we built a space-time stochastic model, a statistical model, um, to model this difference. And then later on, we wanted to have this model uh, more flexible. Um, and the, the flexibility we were looking at was the scale-aware um, capability. And that means that we wanted the, the statistical model actually to be parameterized um, by the resolution of the model. So we just added like a new degree of freedom to the model, which is the resolution at which uh, we operate. So basically the level at, at, of those grid cells. Um, okay, so the way uh, we proceeded um, was to coarse grain uh, high resolution uh, data. 
Um, they serve as a proxy for a model running at a, a, a coarser resolution. And um, it has been shown also that uh, by coarsening fine scale data, we can isolate the subgrid scale variability. Um, and those data were actually cascade data from the Met Office. Um, there were convection permitting available at four kilometers over this entire area. So that's a lot of data. Um, and we focus on a nine day period actually with um, hourly data. Um, and so like I said before, we only want to um, consider the contribution of the wind in those fluxes and um, we consider this uh, exponent uh, form um, of this contribution that um, many of those uh, fluxes actually are and have this uh, exponent of the wind speed um, in their expression. Um, and I just want to reintroduce um, the, um, the expression that I defined earlier. So the ideal flux that we would like to work with is actually the average at the grid cell level capital N of a fine scale flux, which here is actually the wind speed taken to the exponent small n. But in reality, we only have access to the resolved um, zonal and meridional components of the wind that are this u and v in the bracket. And then what we compute in reality is the flux with those resolved uh, u and v components. And um, the idea is to model now um, the discrepancy between those terms. And so we, we use the log here for numerical, a bit of more numerical stability. Um, and so we decided to, to include a deterministic term and a stochastic term. Um, and in the deterministic term, what we want to include is basically information about what we have been able to resolve. So whatever is also available from the model at that moment. So we use um, uh, various uh, uh, monomes of the of the resolved flux and also the precipitation. So the precipitation was really helping to capture um, some smaller scale um, feature also con con convective activity. And then what we did in addition is to uh, fit a space time structure on this uh, st uh, stochastic term. Um, okay, and so in the first work, when we started to work all together in this team, we were working at a fixed resolution. So we decided uh, we were working, I think, at 100 kilometers and 25 kilometers. So all of the quantities were average from four kilometers to 25 and 100. And then we could see the, some kind of similarity between those two uh, levels of coarsening. And so then later on, we decided to go further and uh, consider the space-time model and just look at it at more resolution and, and actually build uh, some parameterization to like go from one resolution to another. Um, and here I'm showing some um, examples actually of uh, some of the ideal flux and the resolved flux. And I'm just showing this, the coarsening, um, various levels of coarsening from not coarsening much to coarsening a lot. and so. Obviously, you, you have very different um, results, but also what we did observe, it's not super obvious here, is also the, depending on the level of coarsening, the discrepancy between the resolved and the ideal flux is different. And also, um, we'll see later on the, really the, the space-time structure of, um, of the sub, this subgrid scale field also is different. Um, so if you remember earlier, um, we were working with um, this regression model. And so what we did, uh, we looked at those regression coefficients at various resolution, and we observed that it's very easy to transition from one level of coarsening to another. So those uh, coefficients, they actually have very smooth transition uh, from one resolution, like level of coarsening to another. So we decided to parameterize them. So this is completely, data driven right to um, come up with those parameterization um, and then the last step is actually also to look at the space-time term stochastic term here and um, the same way we could see also in the space-time structure of this um, stochastic term that the 
its space-time correlation structure was evolving very smoothly with the, the degree of coarsening. Um, and I mean, that's kind of expecting, right? Expected the, the coarser you look at um, those data, the, the smoother they are gonna be in space and time. Um, so here the idea for this uh, stochastic term uh, psi was um, actually now to build a, so each of these psi actually is a space-time process. And the idea was to um, look at, um, kind of consider various resolution of this uh, psi and then just put it together into a, a, a single collection um, and make it a, a one space-time uh, model and just model it jointly. So in the previous work, we were, um, working at a fixed uh, coarsening level, like fixed resolution and fitting a space-time uh, Gaussian process on this uh, term. Like basically, I mean, the mean was taken care of in the previous step. So now it was just fitting um, a covariance. So we were fitting a space-time covariance that has, that is anisotropic. So we have different length scale in the zonal and meridional direction. And then we also have some uh, modeling of the length scale in time. Um, and what we observed though, when we were fitting this, those kind of like isolated, I mean, a single scale space-time process, uh, when you fit them independently at each scale, but then do it at various uh, resolution, you can see that you, your parameters the parameters of the, your covariance, they evolve quite smoothly from one resolution to another. So then the idea again was to um, like come up with a parametrization, like a mathematical way to go from one coarsening level to another um, for those covariance parameters. And so the idea here was um, pretty simple too, is to write those um, correlation length scales as function of the coarsening level um, capital. Um, and so just to be clear though, um, we, when we fit uh, this model, which I can talk about here, um, we do not fit those parametrization, those scalar parametrization at posteriori, like after having fitted uh, the model at each scale where we just take this full model and just fit it on, on several uh, course and data at the same time. Um, and so at first we fit uh, the scale aware regression part to the mean part only on the entire area. Um, and then um, second, we fit um, basically the covariance um, and this area is so big, um, it has so many data points and also a lot of heterogeneity in the space-time structure that uh, we actually tiled the area into subregions that are 500 kilometers by 500. And for continuity purpose, we make them overlap. Um, and then from all of those tiles, we get one fit of the scalar where uh, covariance and um, of the scalar where space-time covariance. And so the scalar where space-time covariance has those, uh, it has actually uh, four parameters, right? It has the, the zonal uh, spatial correlation. So how much you correlate on the east-west um, direction, how much you correlate on the north-south direction and how much you correlate in space or in time. <laughs> and then, uh, here I'm showing actually in green is the functional box plot of actually those um, those uh, functionals, right? That are telling us how the covariance parameters are changing as a function of the coarsening level. And in red are the, the estimates of uh, those same parameters, but if I fit them in a single scale fashion. So if I just have course on my data at one level only and just ignore the rest. So we're kind of doing okay with the scale of our model. We're capturing what we would do, um, was it then? No. Um, what we would do if we would work at single scale. So we have not distorted too much the, those, the dependencies, which was, I think, one of my first uh, concerns. Um, 
And so now that we have all of those estimated parameters on the entire area, um, we can look at them. So here each pixel of the map represents this estimating window on which we have fitted the, the, the covariance model. Um, and so here, the first column is actually the sort of magnitude of each parameter, um, uh, the magnitude of this scalar world dependence. And here we have also this sort of like slope parameters also that tells us like how much we are going to be dependent on the, the model resolution. And so what um, I'm plotting here also the precipitation um, during the mean precipitation during that time period. And what uh, we were a bit quite intrigued by is that uh, all of the shapes that we see, the spatial structures that we see here in the way the parameters depend on the model resolution is actually quite similar also to the shape of the precipitation. So I think there's more also going on um, in what we are modeling now. We should probably have more complex dependence in our model to the precipitation. I think the precipitation seems to be trying to tell us more than what we have done right now. Um, but so, yeah, definitely it was quite interesting to see though that um, how much the parameters of your Gaussian process depend on the level of coarsening. It does vary on the region that you uh, are looking at. Um, for instance, here, this is the like, zonal length scales and meridional length scales. And you can see that they don't even have the same intensity of dependence on the uh, resolution also, which is quite interesting. Um, okay, so just some validation of that model right now. We've fitted it and how, what happens, um, how does it do? Um, so like I said before, we fitted the model um, jointly on three scales only, on three percent uh, resolution. And now with the sort of nice feature of the scalar model is that we can, okay, I'm sorry, Dijon. Um, is that we can express this Gaussian process at any other resolution of interest. I mean, provided that it has physical uh, meaning around it. So basically here we uh, express the model at other um, resolution that we did not see when we trained the model on those resolutions. Um, and like before, we also have this single scale um, model that we only fit at um, a given scale. And so here I was just showing the difference in MSC between the scalar model and single scale. And so on, on average over the entire area, we are actually doing um, a little bit better with the, um, with the scalar model compared to the true signal that we have. Um, and then I wanted to show some time series also. Um, like, are we doing okay in time? Actually, when we use this model, are we capturing um, the sort of true data that we have? So the solid uh, black line is the true uh, flux, the error in the flux. So if you remember, it was this uh, resolved flux, uh, true flux minus resolved um, that uh, I'm plotting here. Um, the dotted uh, line is actually the predicted mean. And now, because we have this uh, stochastic model, actually we can uh, generate lots of scenarios, lots of um, scenarios. And also they are correlated in space and time because we have the space time structure. Um, and so the two models, sort of like single scale model and scalar model are doing pretty good to cover the true signals. And both of them actually are having quite um, equal performance, which was quite nice. Um, and then lastly, the space, spatial structure. So here I'm showing the um, empirical correlation. So I'm actually showing um, contour lines of the uh, spatial correlation. So I basically take every tile that I was using for the estimation. I take the center of that tile and then I plot the contour line of um, the, for the level, I think it's 0 0.8. Um, so basically all of the neighbors uh, that are 
correlated with the center of the tiles at level 0 0.8 are shown by this, um, those lines. So this is um, the empirical one. So we have some shapes here, or we have like elongated um, contours. Um, the scalar model is doing okay, not too bad. Um, it's actually not as good as the scale specific model in that area, but uh, we've also been asking more to that model. So it's still okay, I think. Um, and okay, so that's the, just the conclusion. And um, so we've built like a, uh, try to have a model a bit more flexible uh, than a, simple uh, space-time model so we can use it um, um, at different resolution. Um, and so what we would wanted to say also is uh, Kota, who's a student with uh, Adam, has been working actually on, on this model. He worked on the first model that is scale specific and he was testing it across uh, six other model outputs, four region, and I think various also time, um, time period. And so it was quite interesting. He could um, see that overall uh, across models, this parameterization was fairly robust. Um, and it was fairly robust also overall in space and, and time, other time period. All right, thank you. Um, all right, questions? Um, yeah. I have maybe two or three questions, but I think I'll just ask one. Um, so this scale awareness that you have incorporated into the into the model from the beginning, um, if you had to do just the naive thing to try to do some kind of linear regression, to get it afterwards, uh, how much would you miss um, what you're doing right now? So, do you mean? Oh, you you mean if I would do? Would you take the data that you have done with just fixed resolutions, yeah, and try to do some kind of naive linear fit or linear regression. In order, what what, what, what would you need? So in order, what would you do with this linear regression? Like try to go to another yeah. resolution? Yeah, to get, to get a model and try to scale up what I can do with it. Uh, well, I guess we would miss, um, so you would start, so you would start from like just the, the data, the wind fields, you say, or I'm just not sure I understand the question. Yeah, you, you just start with, what you did without yeah uh, the first model resolution you have yeah. three resolutions to fix and you you get your parameterization for each one yeah and then you just take that and you do some kind of a very naive linear regression of some sort uh, okay. would that work it could be a bit rougher but most of the I mean, most of the shapes that we had here, yeah, yeah, yeah. those are, it may the not, one, the other one was okay. yeah, yeah. Oh, this one, oh, okay. So here, if, if I would, oops, if I would just like use a yeah. linear regression here, I guess, I mean, for some points, it might not be too bad, right? And I mean, here, I think we are over spreading also. So it might actually not be too bad, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I feel like, so, you know, here we are parameterizing the covariance parameters, right? So it's, it's kind of like deep and like the outcomes on the fields actually, Sometimes you don't even see, uh, you can, you have like room for error, yeah. Mm. 
So I'll just quick easy one. Where did you get the validation data from? Who showed it? Oh, it's the same. We just don't fit on so it's the same data set, we just like with 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 he, with held some data. Oh, I see. It's not it's not actual measurements. No, okay. no. No. <laughs> Um, would you be able to to use uh, grids that are irregular with that kind of techniques? Or? Um, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess actually the the Gaussian process are quite nice with that, right? Because in the covariance, actually, uh, here I just input the latitude and longitude, so it really the this covariance doesn't care at all if we are using. Uh, so you could change the but, scaling like locally. And yeah, the, the only thing is that. I don't know how we would do the coarse graining, right? I mean, the really the yeah, the, the, the big. Uh, I mean, we rely heavily on the coarse graining, so yeah. I don't know how we would do that. Because would I, I be mean, like area. if you were able to have like, uh, let's say, you find some region where it's better to have uh, a smaller resolution, then maybe you will be able to adapt it there, but not have to it everywhere. Yes, you what you mean? Yeah, you kind of like. Hinting at uh, kind of like adaptive uh, yeah, mesh yeah. refinement, yeah, but, <laughs> or something uh, like that. But uh, yeah. not um, yeah. So we are not trying to change the. I mean, our goal is not to change the mesh, right, yeah. or the grid, but but the overall, though, yes, we the this GP could take care of data that are irregular. That's for sure. But yeah, I don't know how we would do the coarse graining. If, if for example, you were to like use, uh, I don't know, if it's not that kind of uh, application that you look at, but some other where you have like uh, more data at some areas and like yeah. different observations, or maybe, I don't know, I'm just asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess no. that should be fine. No, but that, no, no. I guess that could no. be fine. No. We are still plenty of time, so um, do you have any any explanation why the n dependence is as it is in your no. in your example? <laughs> no, oh, uh, actually, well, it's not too crazy. Actually, let's see. Um, I mean, is there a physical? Okay, yeah, you, yeah. I guess you no. choose the model based on what you saw yeah. from. Yeah, so there, there is right. Um. So this is the the spatial correlation lengths east west. This is the spatial correlation, and let me just put this guy back. So this is the space uh, spatial correlation length scale, like north in the north south direction. This is temporal length scale, um, and here we course on. So here at that. But here we have not coarsened much, right? So all of the spatial structure are kind of like less correlated. And here we have coarsened more. So everything is just smoother and more correlated. So I think that that definitely seeing the increase in the, that was not too surprising to see the, the increase in correlation length as we coarsen more. I'm not, in the temporal, we have not course and time, so. No, okay. I mean, I agree obvious. that that the you would expect it to grow, but um, yeah. um, you know what you what you saw before seems like a pretty well defined curve. Oh, yeah, the, uh, this one. Yeah, and if there is any <laughs> physical explanation for this, uh, I mean, it's of course very very dependent on the data you look at and the pro probably even the model you look at and mm -hmm. and the variable you look at and whatnot, but. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, just, just wondering if there is an is is a reason why this curve has the shape that it has. Yeah. So actually, here, um, this black one actually is the intercept, right? So it's really the sort of like fixed mean quantity that is neither neither coming from the result flux or from the precip, um, and. I mean, the fact that it's growing at a logarithmic scale, like 
I, I, we did not have any rational, but definitely it, it has, it had to grow kind of as it has to, this, it's kind of like a, a bias, right? So you can imagine as, as you coarsen more, you have more, you have more discrepancy between the fine scale and coarse scale. So that intercept term, term like has more intensity, but the, the rate of growth though is, yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so my question um, with regards to these fluxes. So what you would expect that these fluxes would be a tracer dependent. I mean, the flux of moisture and the flux of temperature is not the same. And here, I'm, if I understand correctly what you're doing, you are just looking at the turbulent fluctuations of the wind. You're not looking at the, at the hard flux, the whole flux as it is. Correct. So I'm just wondering whether this is really um, realistic. Did you? Yeah. Um, how, how would you include the, the trace, tracer dependency? Uh, the dip so how we what we would do like yeah. in reality with that model yeah, yeah well i mean people when they compute these things from empirical data they'd never get the same constant whether it's the temperature yeah, exactly the exactly moisture. yeah so exactly. now we are just doing one yeah uh, and just doing the cfs right yeah yeah exactly uh, so which means you are assuming it's the same thing so i guess there are lots of questions behind that whether you <laughs> Which flux are you looking at? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, are you mixing them, or yeah? Or so do you think that it doesn't it doesn't matter? No, no. I, I think it really does matter. Um, so this is why we had actually this uh, exponent, and oh, that was generic. And so we tested like one, two, and three. I think it must. Uh, I mean, it's, exactly. Sometimes there are fractions, but they kind of are around, around those values. And so, what people have done, though, in um, in in some work, uh, they basically have been um, once that they have built a subgrid a subgrid scale um, distribution for wind speed, they actually sample some wind speed. And then they average the, and then they compute this quantity for each sample of the wind, and then they average the flux. So you kind of actually compute like samples of the flux and average it, and that becomes their like grid cell level flux. Mm. Johan. <laughs> okay. Uh, so my question is: uh, Is your scale aware? What happened to your scale aware model when the resolution tends to zero? Oh, to zero. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, so well, would well, it we, make we, sense? I mean, if, if you want to know the flux at a point and, and derive them, do you? Yeah. Yeah. That yeah, makes yeah. Sense. Um, so, we can, I mean, part of the way we do it, we cannot go below four kilometers, right? Because that's our high resolution data that we cross on. Um, so we cannot really, I mean, um, could you go, I mean, yeah, you would not, yeah, we, we kind of like plateaued there. But if you look at the model, go ahead. and you extrapolate to the right thing. Yeah, the, the, the parameters, the yes. Yeah. Uh, the roof itself off. Or, or do you get Oh, I see what you mean. Do you mean like in the way I parameterize, I yeah. should, prevent it from, I mean, or I should do something when it goes to zero. Yeah, yeah. So maybe it comes off correct. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure this guy is going to where. Uh, yeah. 
have a lot of the trust in God. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah it's true. Yeah. Maybe this is something for an off yeah. discussion. Oh, yeah, yeah. We should, we should <laughs> come to the final speaker of this oh, session. Yeah. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Should I switch this? Uh, no,